The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that smiling face in the upper left-hand corner making his maiden voyage, longtime F, first-time guest, Joe <laughs> Buscali of The Athletic joining us. There's just too much Bill stuff to talk about here. Uh, have to have Joe on. And uh, people have asked me in the past, and Joe knows the reason for this, why isn't Joe on your podcast? And the reason being is because Joe has his own podcast. And I always think it's kind of silly to make the guy come on and give it away for free. The crossover uh, and, effect. or to, Yeah, or to do the show twice, you know. So I always felt guilty. Joe's had me on his podcast a couple of times to talk stadium stuff. But uh, I feel that it's now time to uh, not only, I don't want to say return the favor because it's not a favor. We need to, I need to reciprocate in the sense that so much has gone on with the bills and Joe is more plugged in than I am, especially since the last couple of weeks, I've been following the NCAA basketball tournament and I have not even taken a hard look at any of these contracts. People ask me, Hey, where does this put the bills up against the salary cap? And every day there's a, there's a wrinkle. I have no idea. Joe just learned himself, uh, learned a little factoid earlier today. In fact, uh, regarding, uh, um, regarding Mitch Morse, uh, there's all kinds of tinkering going on. It's hard to know, but Joe's on top of it. Yeah. Joe, thanks for doing this. Yeah, of course, man. Yeah. I, it's, it's a weird time because Bean normally doesn't do this much stuff. And so it's hard to like get my head above the water because, you know, I, I find all these little details and stuff like that, but then I still don't have Case Keenum's details. I still don't have Jamison Crowder's contract. I still don't have Shaq Lawson's contract. I still don't have Matt Barkley's contract. So it's like, okay, what, what are you really looking at here? But, but yeah, it's uh this time of year is always fun. And uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's I, always uh, always a good time uh, getting getting together. I mean, the the last time I was on, I think it was on the actual terrestrial radio. So, sure. So it's been a minute. It has been, and uh, good to see your smiling face. <laughs> In fact, this is the first. Well, no, that's not true. I saw you at the combine. I saw you, but then before that, it was in Arrowhead Stadium. Um, it's nuts. We, I live in the North towns. Joe lives in the South towns. You might, we might as well live in different States. There's just something about North town, South town. That's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to go all the way down there. It's just too far away. Um, you Joe FaceTime, you know, we're not, we're not that, we're not that type. Um, and I don't FaceTime with my parents. So I don't answer FaceTime calls. If people even <laughs> try to do it, I don't even respond. So uh, I, I don't want to uh, preface this question. Uh, I'll, I was going to add, well, all right, I, I'll leave it open-ended. So that way I don't, uh, I don't want to steer the conversation as much as let it happen organically. Joe, what's your favorite signing or, or move that the Bills have made so far this offseason? I think... It's uh, an overwhelming thing. They've kind of reshaped what the locker room dynamic kind of is. And I know that's kind of an abstract answer rather than just like a hard line. Hey, it's Von Miller or it's, hey, it's, uh, I don't know, Jamison Crowder. But it feels like with some of the moves they've they've made, like, you know, re-adding a Jordan Phillips, bringing back Shaq Lawson, bringing back Matt Barkley, it kind of feels like they want to turn back the clock on the locker room dynamic a little bit. 
And, you know, they, they got rid of some, you know, interesting energy, like Cole Beasley's out the door now. And so bringing in guys that, you know, by leaps and bounds, what has been so important to McDermott and Bean is to have the right locker room chemistry, of course, to have good players, but to have the right locker room chemistry and finding or being able to bring back all these guys that they know have a certain effect on, on the people around the locker room. Like Shaq Lawson is one of the biggest jokers from the, from the early McDermott years and his teammates just absolutely loved him. Jordan Phillips kind of along the same wise, a little bit more serious than Shaq, but still those two guys kind of go hand in hand. And then um, Matt Barkley is a huge chemistry guy, even though he might not be nothing, anything more than a practice squad. It just, it almost feels like the bills are slightly more likable is the wrong word, but like, it, it seems like they're, they're trying to turn back the clock a little bit to, to recapture some of that, uh, that juice, so to speak from, from the early playoff years to push them forward to a Super Bowl run. I, I don't know. I, just kind of an abstract thought on it. Well, let's take a look at all of those different moves. You mentioned Cole Beasley, of course. Uh, I think that the most significant um, representation of what you're trying to say, Joe, is is cutting Starla Tulele, a Mm -hmm. player who really wouldn't have hurt them to keep around from a financial uh, situation or a salary cap situation. It was just time to move on from Starla Tulele, uh, I think, as a person uh, (laughs) uh, for what, you know, his his unreliability his, whether you want to call it his flakiness, uh, the fact that he sat out uh, 2020 uh, because he didn't, uh, because he was afraid of COVID, but then didn't get vaccinated. And then he missed time because of the protocols. And, and I think that you can't just, you can't just assume that everything's going to be back to normal in the NFL. We might have another spike in COVID over the summer. You know, who knows what happens when flu season comes around again in 2022, uh, the NFL might lock things down and reenact uh, COVID uh, protocols. So it's not to say that we're totally out of the woods, but optimistically, you would think, well, Star is going to not have to worry about protocol anymore. But anyway, he's gone. Uh, John Feliciano, uh, who claimed to have been vaccinated on social media, but also loved to joust with fans and argue, uh, always seemed to find himself, uh, you know, trying to get into the you know, the kind of the Cole, the Cole Beasley vapor trail or, or in the wake of Cole Beasley, you know, that's sticking up for each other. So guys who weren't necessarily all in uh, are back. However, I do want to point out that Jordan Poyer isn't going anywhere. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there and I have no really idea where we're going to go with it, but it, I do think it's, it is fascinating. Um, what, what do we make of it? Jonah, yourself included. Well, let me, I'd ask more of a question to either both of you. Is this, because if we don't think vaccination status is really going to matter as much next year as it did in the past, is this a reaction or not a punishment, but is this, uh, you know, that the players revealed something about the reliability through this issue that the bills don't want to deal with in right. a different context. Cause right. and effect. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, how important is football to you? How important is being a Buffalo bill to you? How important are your Buffalo Bills teammates to you? I think that's probably the bigger question than uh, are you going to be vaccinated or not? And yeah. so Jordan Poyer, he, yeah, that's true. He did uh, he did uh, get on social media a lot and, and stir it up, but he was out there every week and he was playing to his utmost ability every week. And John Feliciano was not, and Starla Tule was not, and Cole Beasley's production dipped. And while you can say, well, that's a convenient reason to get rid of a guy, it could also be some things behind the scenes of Sean McDermott thinking, I think you're a little too distracted with your social media and not putting in enough time at the facility. And I I can speak from, I think this is an educated assumption. If you recall a few years ago uh, when Lee Smith uh, became one of my all-time favorite locker room guys. He already had been, but working for the athletic, you could quote Lee Smith in his entirety uh, mm-hmm. without censorship. And he was a go-to guy. The bills were winning and he was on the field and he was F bombing this and he was cracking jokes and he was fantastic. He was entertaining, but he kept having a strange penalty every game, a false start. 
um, or he'd line up in the wrong spot or whatever. And then all of a sudden Lee Smith wasn't playing anymore. Not only that, Lee Smith wasn't available after games uh, anymore. And the message I think Lee Smith got was get your mind totally on football, cut the shit out and do well on the field. And then you can be yourself. Um, so maybe that's just an anecdotal way to explain why some of these other moves have been not that it's specifically COVID, uh, but that happened to be the thing that really drew some players attention and focus away from putting in everything they can to be the best Buffalo bill they can be. Yeah. And yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't trying to steer it into the land of COVID and vaccinations or anything like that. I think it it's top shit. Gen- yeah, I know. It's, Too late. I, <laughs> I it, I think it's genuinely more mostly about and, and that definitely plays a part. I think it's mostly about um them trying to find a way to keep things fresh in the locker room rather than it getting stale. Uh and it almost seems like if they ran it back a lot in the same way as they did last year, that it ran the risk of becoming a little bit stale. Like let's say they re-signed Harrison Phillips, they re-signed Jerry Hughes, basically kept the two, the defensive line completely the same. Then you have the same mix of personalities, the same mix of everything and, and, and skill levels. And it just wasn't good enough to the point where, okay, are they really going to be able to get over the hump? Now I do think they improved from a, from a talent level and, Certainly, they helped provide more of a, a fresh perspective from guys coming from other places, now hungry to, to win a Super Bowl. Maybe that reinvigorates some, some other people if, the, if they had trouble with it um, at all last year. Because complacency is a, is a very real thing in the NFL. If you start to have some success, and, uh, and I even think we saw some of it early on in the season. I mean, look no further than the Jacksonville game. We have examples of them playing below expectations, and I wonder if that kind of played a role in it. So just just getting these personalities in there that that will help, you know, really help things come alive. I think that's a that's a reason why they brought Isaiah McKenzie back, because he's one of those glue guys that they always talk about. That's uh, that's pretty important to them, and especially if they're going to push for what they think they can do this year. I think having the, that mix and that sort of energy is, is pretty important for them. But I do think Isaiah McKenzie went through a little bit of a version of the Lee Smith season in a different way, mm-hmm. but he had some distractions and some times when maybe the bills were trying to keep him quiet when, when he had started to talk too much, I think at certain points in the season, but it seems like his ability on the football field and what he did emerging in games late in the season had a lot to do with, wanting to bring him back. Yeah, I like I like I, Isaiah as a player in a certain role. And I know the initial response to his contract was like, oh God, they just signed him for over $8 million for two years. Like what, what, are, they, what are they doing? But once the contract details came out, it was really a two year, I think 4.4 million deal. And I don't necessarily know that that means he's going to be locked in as as their starting slot guy. I think they like him in kind of the role that he was and everything like that. And now, especially with Jamison Crowder um, coming through, I think he probably assumes more of the Beasley role than McKenzie and McKenzie just kind of slots back into his, his usual, usual role. But yeah, he's, he's another example of how, you know, sometimes complacency can get you that, that fumble against Indianapolis, they gave him a really harsh lesson. And by sitting him for, for two straight games and, but to his credit, you know, he was engaged even when they, they made him a a healthy scratch. Like I remember putting the binoculars on him in, um, in new Orleans, almost the entire game on the sideline, because I wanted to see his body language. I wanted to see how engaged he was with his teammates. And if he was kind of sulking off to the side, but he was right there in it with everybody. And I think that was probably an important moment for him because, you know, they feel that their, their assistant coaches see that. So that type of energy is probably why he got the chance he did later in the year. The sexiest of the moves, uh, Von Miller and uh, 
Joe, I, I wanted to ask your thoughts on Von Miller and the contract uh, relative uh, where he is and his career arc, what should be mm -hmm. expected. Um, I, I think that uh, Bill's fans are savvy enough, especially since it's uh, now uh, several days removed from the splash, uh, that they are able to look at it and see that this is a two or three year contract. Uh, this is not uh, an eight year contract or I'm sorry, a six year contract, I should say. Uh, he's not going to be pass rushing at 39. Um, <laughs> Pro Football Focus, I believe, called this an average signing, meaning based on the money and what's to be expected, uh, you know, what what the Bills have to gain. I'm not asking you to refute or uh, or or underline uh, Pro Football uh, Focus's uh, assessment on it, but um, but what's yours? Well, all things considered, Von Miller, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, very sexy. It shows that Brandon Bean is not lying back. Uh, it shows uh, much unlike last year when when fans really wanted the Bills to make that one move that made it at least seem as though they are going to be better uh, to get over the AFC Championship hump. Uh, that that move never really came last year. Well, here's this one, um, and and especially right after losing some guys that this move came, it came right after losing Harrison Phillips and right after losing Levi Wallace and fans are like, well, geez, what are we going to do on defense? Well, here's your big name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I generally like the, the pieces of the signing. Like there's always going to be question marks when you're signing a soon to be actually, I think later this week, 33 year old pass rusher um, who has, really depended on his explosiveness a lot you know his technique is still really good but you know you you do lose a little bit as as you get older into the league so that was my primary concern because now like, like you alluded to it's it's at least a two-year commitment probably a three they can get out after two and basically break even and just have his cap hit on there um which is around 20 million but the the my my guess is that they'll probably extend it to three as long as he continues to be happy and they're winning and everything like that. And the relationship is is good. My guess is it probably turned into a three. Um, but you have to wonder how effective he'll be throughout throughout the duration of the contract. But I think more than anything, this is a a declaration for 2022 because you're not getting that guy without some sort of commitment into the future. And for, and he's still a really effective player. Is he the same Hellraiser that he was earlier in his career? I don't think so. Um, I'm aiming to watch every single one of his snaps from this past year, maybe the past couple in, in the next few days here to really get a sense of who he is now. Um, but from what he looked like in the playoffs, he still looked like he had a lot of juice and had that, um, finishing capability that maybe the bills have been lacking. Cause I, I feel like I was one of the last people on, on the Jerry Hughes is good bandwagon uh, because his stats weren't there. And, but even though his pressure rate was top 10 in the NFL every single year, but there, it just didn't have that finishing element to it. So now they think with Vaughn that they have that finisher, the closer, if you will, to bring down the quarterback and, make or bring attention to him away from Ed Oliver, which in turn could make him into a star this year, help out the rest of the, of the defensive line. And then from there, the off the field aspect to it, which I think is pretty important to the signing because he is, you know, being, being there when, when he rolled through the, the media room on, I don't even know what day it was. Was it Thursday, Friday? I can't remember. Um, it just felt like there is a, a certain star quality to him, like a presence. You, you, you're in a room and you see the guy walk through and it's like, and he just kind of like demands the, the attention. I, and from stories that I've heard from, People like Jordan Rodrigue, who covers the Rams for the athletic, you know, that was the kind of focus that he brought to the Rams as soon as he got there. And it was one of the, the big reasons that, that uh, helped them get over their playoff hump. So although all those things considered, I would call it an above average to good signing, 
Uh, the money isn't great later on, but you know, it, the, if he helps them get to where they want to go in 2022, they don't give a crap what's happening in 2024. And they're certainly not going to pay him $30 million in base salary in 2027. <laughs> Tim thinks he's sexy. I don't know if you heard that. I did hear that. He emphasized that a few times. It's a sexy signing. Uh, he does. Uh, he does always wear fashionable glasses. I will say that. What about the uh, defensive line as a whole, Joe? A lot of moving parts there. Guys coming, guys going. Mm -hmm. What's uh, what's your overall assessment of where the defensive line stands now? And who do you think is maybe the odd man out if there is one? Uh, among the pass rushers. Yeah, it, they definitely reformatted it. Um, the only, they changed out five pieces out of nine that they had last year. So now it's three new defensive tackles, two new pass rushers. Although I did find it interesting that they, they labeled Von Miller a linebacker rather than a defensive end. I don't know if there's anything to that, but, you know, maybe I, I don't know. Just it was, I just found it interesting. So it sometimes they they put weird designations on players and yeah, you know, just something to kind of put in the back of the head. But anyway, the defensive line on the whole, I think they are more dynamic in terms of getting back to the quarterback. That's another element of like it just kind of being a little stale last year because they weren't able to do that consistently enough outside of Jerry Hughes and um at Oliver Harrison Phillips did a better job of it down the stretch, but he's more of a run stuffer. Um, uh, and Rousseau really tailed off at the end of the season. Basham and Epinesa were just kind of guys. They didn't really do anything of substance outside of one game or two, maybe. Um, so I think to answer your question, uh, uh with the edge rushers, Shaq Lawson is in Buffalo now to, push AJ Epinesa because this is the year for Epinesa. You know, last year it was a uh, earn it or go to the bench situation for another third year player, which was Cody Ford. And we saw them give him three starts at the beginning of the year. He got absolutely trucked by Deron Payne in week three in Washington. And he was removed from the starting lineup immediately from there, from that point forward. He made a couple of starts because of injuries and guys going on the COVID list, but you know, it, the, the book was written on him. So Epinesa is in a similar spot now. He's a rotational player at best. It's not going to be a starter. He's not going to start over Rousseau. It's not going to start over Von Miller. So now he has to prove that he can earn a spot on the game day roster and take snaps away from Shaq Lawson and from Boogie Basham. And this is a, a big time check for him. And we'll, we'll see how he responds to it. Is, is there, there a, a concern at all? Well, I mean, maybe Tim's going to ask the same question. Is it a concern at all that the bills had to spend so much free agent capital on a front four that they've also invested so much with the draft picks recently and, you know, what kind of opportunity cost is lost or yeah. maybe squandered when a lot has been put into this defensive line in the past couple off seasons. Yeah, it, it definitely has. And it, it's a, it's a good point. I, th I think for them, they see like the arc of what's going on with their team. And the biggest factor for me with, you know, putting all these funds toward the defensive line and why it probably makes sense to them this year above all the other years is because Josh Allen's cap hit is still manageable right now before it really kicks in this year. He's I think at 16.37 million uh, on the cap and they can reduce that a little bit, but in 2023 and that, that, that sucker goes up to 39 mil. And so now for them, they, they look at it probably like, okay, this is an opportunity where we're still kind of in a rookie window. Not really, but, yeah, basically a little bit. And to fix the defensive line right now, maybe even put a Band-Aid on it just for now until some of these young guys maybe grow into it and go with a proven commodity rather than continue to draft to the position. So, yeah, definitely they've sunk a lot of resources into it over the last two years, last three years, really. 
but to them, that is probably the missing piece of what can help them get to where they weren't. And if they were just a tiny bit better at getting to Patrick Mahomes last year, maybe they don't have to worry about 13 seconds. And that's probably what's sticking in their brain more than anything. And perhaps it's a bit of an overreaction, but you know, they feel like they're close. And if it ends up in a Super Bowl win, then they won't give a crap. <laughs> How careful do Bills fans need to be regarding Shaq Lawson? There's an excitement level about Shaq Lawson that I feel is really out of whack. Uh, yeah, he's fun. Uh, he's a great, he's energetic. First round pick. Uh, yeah, first round pick. Um, and yeah, the guy wants to come back, which is cool. That's how cool Buffalo is now. Guys don't, they don't want to leave. And when they have an opportunity, they come back and all right, we Shaq Lawson. Yes. Shaq Lawson is on his fourth team in four years. The yeah. bills. I don't want to say got rid of him because it was toward the end of his, his rookie deal, but the bills could have had him back three years ago. If they wanted him, they didn't, he goes to Miami. Miami didn't want him around. The Jets cut him before the end of the season. He had one sack last year for a team that's always playing against the, you know, from behind. Uh, so I guess, you know, that's, that's a problem, I guess. Uh, but can you really say, you know, Hey, Aaron Maben led the Jets in sacks one year. Aaron Maben had seven sacks for the lowly shit heel Jets one year. Shaq Lawson wow. had one last year. Um, what, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'll, I'll say it. And then Joe, I'd like your, your response. I, sure. I think it's a big overreaction that Shaq Lawson is back from a football standpoint. Well, I'll, I'll agree to, to a certain degree, but I, to add to your point, you know, he wanted to be back last year after the Jets cut him and the bills <laughs> didn't have him back. <laughs> they and didn't the, bills have him. Used, uh, could, the bills could have used, I don't mean him, but the bills could have used a guy like the bills fans think Shaq Lawson is right. Yeah. He yeah. would have if Shaq Lawson from four years ago, the bills would have been like, we need exactly that. And he was available and they didn't go get him. They, they could have thrown him on the practice squad, made a made him active over bookie Basham or AJ Epinesa or something, but, but they didn't. Um, so yeah, I agree. It's, it's a bit of an overreaction because he's not the same dude. He's nothing more than a rotational piece to play behind Von Miller. And he's a good run defender that will occasionally get home to the quarterback. And when he gets home to the quarterback, it's probably going to be really fun for fans because he'll let everybody know about it, but that's just who he is. Like he's, he's, he's very, boisterous he's joking they love him in the locker room that sort of thing and I think that's why fans love him too but he's not the first round pick that's he's at this point signing a one-year deal which I don't have the details on it yet but I'm assuming is not that lucrative um given you know kind of his market over the last couple of years 19th then, overall draft pick 19th overall and Off he's the bus starter <laughs> thanks rex uh and he he's just a he's a good run defender and he, he'll give them good snaps and like i said he's gonna push aj epinesa and if epinesa proves that he's and basham both prove that they're more worth the snaps than jack lawson i could see lawson being game day inactive um so it's just a guy the fifth guy and they like having nine defensive linemen and now he can rise to as high as you know, sixth or seventh of those nine defensive linemen. Are you sure he even makes the team? Yeah, I, I think he will. I think they they like his locker room um, presence more than anything. And, you know, combining him with Jordan Phillips. I know I've said this locker room thing a few times, but that's how important it is. Like special teams was the the big uh, to do for a long, and it still is for them. The, the whole locker room chemistry standpoint, they just – they they feed on that stuff with that coaching staff and that that front office. I'm going to dial it down a little bit further and go from meeting room chemistry. Uh, I guess I should say from locker room chemistry to meeting room chemistry. Uh, the position group that I am most interested in uh, is a position that had to be changed because of circumstance and had to be overhauled. The Bills did not have an option to do this, unlike defensive line, which the Bills decided by choice to overhaul. The quarterback meeting room uh, had to look totally different because when Brian Dable left, 
Uh, he took Davis Webb with him. He took assistant quarterbacks coach Shea Tierney with him. Uh, he or the Jake Fromm was already gone, if that matters to you. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky uh, signs with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, everybody knew that he was going to be gone. So here's Josh Allen all by himself in the meeting room. Uh, and his former quarterbacks coach now has other duties as the offensive coordinator. Josh Allen's security blanket turned, in, turned into a, a washcloth. Uh, and so they go back a couple of years and they get Matt Barkley uh, to come in. And then the trade for Case Keenum came out of nowhere because I think a lot of people saw the Matt Barkley news as, oh, well, there's your backup quarterback. No, no. No, no. Case, Matt Barkley is around to be what Davis Webb was, the coach on the field, using finger quotes. You still need somebody to be able to come in and win you games, which Bill's general manager, Brandon, being alluded to at the, at the scouting combine, they need somebody there because – Josh Allen doesn't always slide when he's supposed to. He sometimes takes that extra step in bounds. Uh, he'll take that hit. You can say maybe it's even a dirty hit. Maybe even it's a borderline hit that draws a 15-yard flag uh, for unnecessary roughness. But that's no consolation prize when your guy's getting, uh, you know, carted off the field. Um, so the Bills need a guy who can win them games. Matt Barkley's not it. So I guess I open it up to, to Joe and Jonah. Uh, your, the thoughts on the quarterback room, uh, two guys that, as Bills fans, you probably hope to never hear from all season, but who play a very important role to getting Josh Allen ready on a week-to-week -week basis. Yeah, I think with, uh, with Barkley, uh, one of my, my favorite lines – from a friend of mine said, you know, they just, they just wanted someone that would watch Euro trip with Josh Allen, <laughs> which is just tremendous because he, he loves, he loves that, that uh, brand of, of movie and loves quoting all these things. So yeah, that I found that rather hilarious, but Barkley is there as the glue guy of, of the quarterback room. They loved him here. But Barkley, like I saw the, that reaction on Barkley, too, when that first came down. <laughs> People were like, oh, yep, that's the backup. But it's like, no, he uh, spent the entire year last year on practice squads and was eventually elevated. He was actually on two teams that played the Bills last year. I believe it was the Titans and the Falcons, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, so he he was never going to be that guy. But, yeah, he's, he's probably – if he makes the team and then – He'll be the uh, the third stringer. If he doesn't, then they'll bring him back on the practice squad. That's he that's make the, the team. He could, he could. They're not keeping a, a special teams running back this year, so um, maybe he could. You know, know, and it could be like as a favor type thing too. Like we'll keep yeah. you on the roster as opposed to the practice squad because that has implications with things like your pension mm -hmm. and your recruits and things like that. There's obviously a status aspect to it, but I don't think that Matt Barkley was in demand. Oh, no. Oh, no. And no, no. you know, he wanted to come back. I mean, things are good for him here. Mm -hmm. uh, he can, if he wants to launch a career as a coach, uh, being known as Josh Allen's prep guy isn't, isn't the worst way uh, to start your, your assistant coaching career. If you want to become an offensive coordinator or head coach in the NFL someday, I don't know yeah. if Matt Barkley has any desire to do that, but it beats uh, being the practice squad guy for, <laughs> Marcus uh, Mariota Jaguars Jaguars every team I kept thinking of I used to have like set set teams I could go to like Cincinnati you can't do that anymore Cleveland Cle oh, Cleveland would have been a good choice too I could have said Cleveland Detroit um, is the ultimate here yeah, go be Jared Goff oh I'm sorry yeah Detroit Handler. yeah but, I think other markets care this much about the third quarterback because I remember last training camp everything was about the Davis Webb Jake Fromm competition and who was going to be the third? Maybe the Bills should keep four quarterbacks. And I feel like it's a, a relevant position elsewhere around the league. I think yeah. they do in, in markets where your quarterback is a star because it's fun to talk about quarterbacks. Uh, everybody's gone out in the backyard and thrown a pass or tried to hit their buddy on a, on a seven yard out. You know, people think, you know, there's something about quarterbacks. And when your quarterback is set, sometimes that can get boring in terms of things like training camp and, 
Yeah, I, I think that's all it is. I think people just are fascinated by quarterbacks. I, you know, think of uh, Drew Brees, you know, behind him. You know, if there was There's always a discussion. 32 good quarterbacks, much less 96. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. Something like that. Well, let's have I, a fun quarterback conversation. Do you, either of you think the Bills should have considered Colin Kaepernick? If you need a backup quarterback and that's somebody with a talent skill set that might be a little similar to Josh Allen. Yeah, I think they absolutely should have thought about it if the money was right. And that that's the biggest part to it, because they when they acquired Case Keenum, they reduced his salary down to three and a half million. I think it was Field Yates reported that we don't have the contra- the details on it yet. But if if he was willing to come in and be that backup for three and a half million, then absolutely they, they should they should have kicked the tires on. I mean, super fascinating skill set on him. I mean, and. I don't know how um, how he translates into the Bills offense with Ken Dorsey running the show, but a lot of similarities with with Allen in terms of arm strength and, uh, you know, the ability to to rush to the edge and he could definitely come in and and steal games. So, yeah, I I think he absolutely should have been on the radar if if he wasn't. Um, But, you know, knowing what might get. Kaepernick back into the league, I think the option to potentially start uh, might have driven his his interest elsewhere if he is going to get that. But I think he absolutely should be in the league and, and get an opportunity somewhere. Like you know, Atlanta is kicking the tires on Marcus Mariota right now, and maybe it works, but that was mostly due to a, a past relationship with Arthur Smith uh, in Tennessee between Mariota and and uh, the coach. Um, Jameis Winston is getting another chance in New Orleans. And I'm just, it's just like, okay, it's let, let the guy come in and compete with someone. Um, the Bill situation is just different because there's more of an established guy. But if, if they were looking, then they, they should have called him. Colin Kaepernick, uh, his absence from the NFL for a few years now has has provided the convenient excuse for any team that wouldn't want to bring him in. It would be like, well, he's been out of the game too long. And the reason he's been out of the game too long is because nobody wanted to give him a chance when things were too hot. Yeah. And now that yep. things have cooled down, you can still have your convenient excuse. And uh, I think it's going to have to take a very brave team to bring him in. And I think that uh, it is a shame. And people have made this, uh, this allegory that uh, the Browns probably feel like they're very brave uh, to bring in uh, Deshaun Watson, but just taking on risk doesn't make you brave. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that um, it would be a very brave thing to do in in actuality to uh, sign Colin Kaepernick and, and bring him into the fold uh, onto your team. Uh, you know, Seattle, you know, P. Carroll had some things to say about that uh, last week regarding, oh, he absolutely deserves a second chance. Well, okay, Seattle. Um, hey, Pete, you're starting Drew Locke. Yeah, you have it. You have an opportunity here. You just got rid of Russell Wilson. And uh, if the guy deserves a second chance, why not on your team? You know, that's the classic not in my backyard thing. Like, yes, we need prisons, but don't build one here. You know, not in my town. Um, the garbage dump, you know, the, the landfill. Yeah, we need landfills, but I, no, 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 no. Somebody else put that in somebody else's town. Uh, I think that Colin Kaepernick can be a, a lift and, a, and an inspirational figure uh, for for an organization, but the NFL doesn't seem to to think it uh, that way. Um, Joe, your thoughts on the JD McKissick situation? It it's rare to see a a GM get as fired up in a press conference setting as Brandon Bean was about that situation you know i found it pretty weird um when it all kind of happened and i texted uh you about it tim like you know thinking about different different angles to look at here and you know my my thought back then was like okay there there might be something to this this whole mckissick thing and i did not expect brandon bean to go on go up to the stage and and be like look It's not the agent's fault. It's not the player's fault. It's the other team. Didn't even refer to him by name. It's the other team. And what makes it even saucier is that it's guys he worked with in the past, like Marty Herney, who is someone that 
he worked under for a long time in Carolina is a member of that staff with the commanders. Ron Rivera is over there. And I'm sure Ron doesn't have as much to do with, with that sort of situation. Their GM right now is Martin Mayhew. Um, I, I, I didn't look back to see if they had any crossover, but I'm sure they know each other, but it, it's the Herney one that probably um, hurts him the most. And he views Marty Herney as a mentor of his. Yeah. When I uh, did my feature on Brandon Bean uh, being hired as uh, the Bills general manager, uh, he uh, I, I can't remember who gave I think Brandon himself might have even given me Marty's number to say, hey, talk to Marty. You know, or it might, I might have also gotten it from the Bills, but um, yeah, yeah, Marty Herney was quoted extensively about uh, about his uh, his young protege, Brandon mm-hmm. Bean. Yeah, and to for that to unravel the way that he did, I I understand that there's because Bean probably would never do that, but and it's kind of an unwritten rule to go back to the player after an agreement is is done. But not everyone plays by the same, I guess, moral obligations when it comes to being a GM in in the NFL, if there is such a thing. Uh, So I I understood where he was coming from. I understood why he was hurt by it because of the personal relationships to it. Like the last person you're expecting to, to do that or be affiliated with that is someone that you looked up to for for years and years and years, or at least learned from. And it that's sounds just like cu- when it, it, it's an unwritten rule, obviously, Joe, yeah. apparently yeah. it was like a, a, pure, a, a look back behind the curtain, which was what made it so fascinating. Not only if, if you follow the bills, but around the NFL, people were looking at this as like, Oh, wow. And there was mm-hmm. some disagreement. I, I also saw from various analysts. Um, so I just want to ask, I mean, it's maybe rhetorical because it is something that I've never really encountered before. And I, it was educational to me to hear Brandon Bean um, couch it the way that he did. But why, why is the agent off the hook? If the agent's off the hook because, well, the deal's not done and he has to do what's best for his client. Okay, I get that. Well, if the deal's not done, then why can't a football team do what it feels is best for it? So it seemed as though, and I'm reading between the lines, that maybe Brandon was upset because of who it was, not necessarily that it was done, which is to the point of what you're saying. If it were the Detroit Lions had done it, maybe Brandon's not as upset. And I'm again, I don't know that for sure. But to me, it seems a little uneven that the you know the ink the the deal wasn't signed, and we hear about these all the time in other sports, um, where you know, an offer sheet in hockey, or there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of mechanisms. If the deal's not done, although maybe he's saying because it was in that pre, you know, right. the pre, you know, because the year you hadn't started yet. I, I mean, I get it, but if the agent's allowed to keep looking out for his best interests, I think that the team, it seems, it seems to be um, just as ethical from, from that standpoint. There were yeah, other I, players that did this. It's not like this right. is the only situation around the league that went that way. I think there are two like um, ways that that it could happen. Either a the player gets cold feet and um, decides that that offer isn't right for him before he actually signs, and b which I think Bean probably would have been a little bit more understanding from that perspective if, if it was just McKissick saying, "Hey, you know what." I don't know that I that I want to move up to Buffalo. I thought about it, slept on it, <clears throat> excuse me, everything like that. And I, I want to I want to see what else is out there for me. I think it was the act of after the agent had communicated to Washington after not having an offer in the in the first place, like uh then going going there and be like, well, you haven't signed yet, so let's let, let me, let me tell you our pitch. Like they had a lot of time to do that. And that probably what spurned being the most, but to your point, it's an unwritten rule. And that's, what's going to happen when you allow this two day window, like it doesn't allow the opportunity for teams to actually ink these players. And it sets up for more drama from that perspective. And this is not going to be the last time that, that, that this happens. 
teams will gain an edge wherever they can. And if they felt like, oh, that's what McKissick, that's what he signed for. That's what he's signing for. Crap, we'll do that. Like that, it was probably a, some part of that too. So unless the NFL just sits there and goes, all right, flat out, screw this, you know, early negotiating window crap. Let's just start the whole thing at, at noon on Monday, start the league year and go. Like it's just, it just seems like such a novelty that all of these deals are done like in the first 36 hours of this negotiating window, but none of them can be signed. None of them can be official. It allows these opportunities for these teams to kind of, to kind of swoop in. I don't know. I, I just, well, Joe, then you're suggesting they roll it back to the way it was, which was really the same thing where, at, yeah. you know, one minute after free agency opened, there was this complicated, you know, five year, $60 million a year uh, deal or uh, I know. Sorry, five year, $60 million deal. Um, already done, and it was done in 59 seconds. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, I mean, I, I and uh, bonuses and all kinds of things. I know. Like, wow, man, that, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's elite negotiating skills. I, it's just, it's to me, it's like everybody knows people talk before the fact, and and people talk even well before the combine about these prospective free agents. No one is like. Oh my goodness, they're talking. Everyone's in the same freaking place in Indianapolis. They all go to the same bars. They all go to the same restaurants. Everyone's communicating. Like, let's let's not let's not act like this. There's just this layer of ice between the start of free agency and um, and where you are post Super Bowl. It's just it's kind of silly that the NFL is keep, keeps going with the charade. Right. Well, what do we care either way? Like. If this is how they negotiate, this is how they negotiate. Yeah, exactly. Just just because it's like the the accounting that you have to you have to go with. There, well, can't negotiate until two days before. Well, people, like even even then, I think there was a deal that came down where um, it was done within minutes. Who was it? Maybe Alex Kappa of the Bengals. There was like this big contract that that he signed pretty much first second that the window was open. It was like, well, how'd they do that? It's just, it's just very silly. <laughs> Let's uh, any other bills thoughts uh, before we change uh, topics here. Uh, do we want to talk about the offensive? Yeah, line? I have a question for Joe. Oh, go ahead, Jonah. <laughs> Not about the offensive line though, but it, in general, how can you explain and, without it taking an hour, a little bit of how a team that was up against the cap and really over the cap. At I have one to get point, a haircut in a half hour, by the way, was <laughs> how the bills, but how any team can create all this cap space and pretty much sign any player they want, including yeah. a really big money free agent, Von Miller. And can a team keep doing that over and over again? Can the bills play these cards the way they did in future years? Or is this a once in kind of a, not a lifetime, but kind of once in a cycle opportunity that they had this off season. I think for them, the way that Bean usually likes to play, it's a it's a once in a cycle opportunity because of Allen's contract and the fact that they have been so close the last couple of years. I think that plays into it. But there are ways that you can uh, that you can maneuver the cap um, every single year. I don't know if it's to the sense in that you can just keep doing this year over year and not lose anybody um, you're going to lose people because eventually all of those, all that money that gets pushed down the line is going to impact your cap pretty significantly to where you have to release somebody you didn't probably didn't want to. So to answer your question, it's the way that I kind of look at the salary cap is it's fluid more than a hard line. Um, there are multiple things GMs can do. And the thing that Bean did more than anything, more than any other year this year was add a lot of void years to contracts, whether it be pre-existing ones and, um, and new ones like the pre-existing ones, the, the go-to for that is you can do this thing called a, a basic conversion where they convert a, a big portion of their base salary and maybe the roster bonus they were due that year. And then you can prorate it over the duration of the contract. So an example is 
uh, Micah Hyde, who they pushed him out three years past the conclusion of his deal. They added three void years to it. And it created, I think, around five and a half, maybe 5.8 million on, on this year's salary cap. And that was something that Bean hasn't done before, but he knew that he was on the precipice of, of signing a guy like Von Miller. So you can do things like that. You can structure contract, new contracts in a way where like Von Miller, for instance, his base salary this year is super low because all the money that he's getting paid this year came in the form of a signing bonus that you can push, uh, that you can prorate over four years or five years maximum. And so that's, so he gets his money up front and the bills can go through and say, Hey, his cap hits 5.1 million this year, even though he's getting paid, you know, 19 million. It's, it's a way. Um, I don't think it's, necessarily prudent to continue to do it that way year over year over year like the saints do um because like i said eventually you're gonna you're gonna lose guys but there there are ways around everything but the credit card always comes due and brandon bean has never had credit card debt or so he claimed to us at well he does now i was gonna ask him that the other day but I, but I, we ran out of time i'm like <laughs> what how's it feel to have credit card debt now brandon yeah, what's this? What's the three-digit security code on the back of that card? <laughs> but you've memorized it now. Um, let's shift over to uh, basketball. I know you guys love to talk basketball. I am a little bit uh, out of that, even though I did did just cover the NCAA basketball tournament, and I totally felt like a fish out of water. I actually have to write a story about uh, Providence and Ed Cooley this evening. Oh, you're um, right there, yeah. I'm sorry, Jonah. I said, oh, you didn't write that yet. No. I was trying to learn some things so I could write intelligently. Um, go ahead. I'll open the floor to you uh, To you guys. Hoop heads. Hoop heads? Yeah. Hoople heads. I mean, Joe, what did you do this weekend? What games did you watch or what, what caught your eye basketball-wise in the first weekend of March Madness? Yeah. Um, I thought the... How and, and it's a low hanging fruit, but I, like St. Peter's is just an amazing story <laughs> going through and beating Kentucky the way that they did, having having that coach who, you know, just uh, long time history in college basketball and then going through and and beating one of the the hottest mid majors in, in Murray State. Um, the, the game wasn't even like particularly enthralling just because it wasn't like high scoring back and forth, anything like that. But, you know, them being able to push through into the sweet 16 is like, uh, to me that I, I'm not a huge college basketball guy. I'm more NBA than, than college. So I'll, I'll defer to you, but that's, that's gotta be one right up there with um, things you, you look back on in tournament history. Like, wow, that, that was kind of ridiculous that that happened. Yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. I mean, it's only happened three times. One of them was last year. 15 seed get into the sweet 16 but you know i covered along with tim the two games in buffalo on saturday night and i ended up writing about saint peter's for the most part because mm -hmm. there was there was a local connection with that story and it was the big story of the tournament uh the athletic director rochelle paul is a williamsville east graduate a canisius lacrosse and soccer player and came from working at canisius and for the mac and just in general, Shaheen Holloway has a Buffalo connection, having played in those first NCAA tournament games in 2000 in Buffalo. And then just being a team from one of the Buffalo schools leagues and the MAC hosting the NCAA tournament in Buffalo and St. Peter's wins over the course of six years is going to be worth at least 4 million, if not more for the conference. And it shows that St. Peter's was a good team, probably the second best team in the league all year long and, and ended up winning the tournament. But it shows that, Canisius or Niagara or any other team in the MAC with the right coach and the right players and the right team at the right time can go to the NCAA tournament and can be the big story, the big national story and do, you know, reach that level that it's not unattainable for any school at the division one level. All you have to do is be the best in your league and you'll get that opportunity. Holloway's got to be gone now, right? Like there, there's someone's going to scoop him up. I mean, it's, it's almost seems faded that he's going to be the Seton Hall coach. Seton yeah. Hall lost Ralph Willard to Maryland. He was an assistant under Ralph Willard not that long ago. The Seton Hall AD is formerly the St. Peter's AD that hired him at St. Peter's. He played there. It just seems, unless there's another big job that goes after him and it's more money and more prestige, something like that could happen. But other than that, 
it does seem pretty not set in stone, but it does seem like he'll be the seat in the hall coach sooner or later. The I'll ability it. to to unfurl that sweet 16 banner, if you're a Metro Atlantic school, that has to be the equivalent of winning the whole thing, pretty yeah. much. Pretty, I mean, it's never happened for a men's team. There's a couple of women's teams have done it, and that was a big deal. But financially, it's not as a big deal doing it in the women's tournament. It doesn't net the conference that kind of money and the media exposure isn't the same thing but basketball wise it's, it's a big deal but yeah it's never happened in 41 years of the mac it's been rare for teams to win just one of the games i think that's only happened like a half dozen times i i feel like i mean, I mean it's it's an awesome story horrible matchup against purdue coming up i mean they've got size yeah, they've got size. nba talent it's like you could probably stack two saint peter's players and they won't be the size of zach Eady. <laughs> down low he's like what seven three seven four right yeah uh, i mean but kentucky's really big too kentucky sure. had some issues with shooting and being a young team i think purdue is especially with a few days now to prepare i, I think it's going to be tough for saint peter's but yeah. once you win one of those upsets you have the belief and then as fans we can watch and think they might do it again you've seen them do it once then you know if kentucky played purdue we'd say you know maybe that's a toss-up game or whatnot you wouldn't think that Kentucky can't beat Purdue. So it seemed to beat Kentucky. It's almost like a boxing. Well, they, they beat mm-hmm. the champion, so now they can beat this guy too. Um, I'm the uh, three peacocks in a trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, I, just St. Peter's has a big guy, I'm forgetting his name right now, who was the defensive player of the league in the MAC. They have a little bit of size and act like a team that plays all guards and going to be totally overmatched. And Shaheen Holloway had that really good quote about being, you know, we're not afraid of teams that are bigger than us. We're bigger and tougher and we're from New York mm-hmm. City and that's mm-hmm. what we do. But yeah, as you mentioned, it, Purdue also has Jaden Ivey, one of the best guards in the country, and they have multiple big guys. They're one of the biggest teams in the country. And it just does seem like this is maybe where the, the run ends for St. Peter's. But, you know, they did it twice, and maybe they can do it again. Let me uh, flip over to the women's side because I think uh, just a casual observation from going through and, and watching, watching some of the highlights and, and seeing some of the scores – does it almost feel like there's maybe not with the with the top seeds? Does it almost feel like there's more parity and and ability for upsets now than there had been previously? Because we see teams like South Dakota make it through to the Sweet Sixteen. Um, yeah, but you it, see also these you know you'll see like a, a seeding that's like I don't know a twelve and a four, and that's a fifty point blowout. Like yeah, there's some yeah. of these games that are just so out of whack. It's not. It even, feels like. It just feels like the gap is getting closer. Not like the top teams, because, you know, you still can probably count on South Carolina, Stanford, uh, NC State, Louisville, UConn, every, everything like that. But like Baylor lost and Baylor's been a huge, huge team in, in women's college basketball for literally for. Yeah, for, for a lot of years. Um, so I, I don't know I, the casual observation. Open it to the panel. I do think that's the case. I mean, I don't look Mine's at it casual and study it and know the <laughs> statistics every year, but I do know. When Marist came out of the MAC and went to the Sweet 16, and St. Bonaventure did this around the same time, maybe 15 years ago, in each of those cases, every other team that was in the Sweet 16 was like a one, two, three, or four seed. So it was very uncommon for anybody but the top four seeds to advance to the second weekend of the tournament. And now, just anecdotally, you're seeing up- upsets that I don't remember seeing before lower seeds and top teams with top players losing in the first or the second round more often and there are still dominant teams but it's not the same Kentucky playing Tennessee every year and it used to be the final four was almost the same three four five teams trading spots every single year and you're seeing a little bit more women's programs cycling in and and not parity but more variety and who are the best teams year in and year out yeah yeah absolutely um the other the other college uh thing I'll mention that that's cool uh I mean, the local name that everyone knows, Turner Battle, his Middle Tennessee Blue Raiders, they're in the, uh, well, he's an assistant coach there. They're, I think, in the semis in the CBI. So that's that's a, another Buffalo angle to to root for as well, these he, tournaments go on. You got that on me. I, I I have not been paying much attention to the CBI. I didn't know that. And yeah, yeah. They're the Turner, t- they were a good team that was near the top of their league, and I thought maybe had a chance to make the NCAA tournament, and they did not. Yeah. UAB snipped them. Um, and they uh the moils of college them. basketball yes UAB. Turner, boy. snipped them the they uh 
they're the two seed in the CBI. I only know this, know this stuff. Well, a, because, you know, looking for, for Buffalo links and everything like that. But like, um, my former colleague at channel seven, Jeff Rusak, um, this is, this is a fun thing that he has established every year. He has a bunch of people to do the mega bracket pool, um, which is everyone that gets involved. Uh, you pick the men's, the women's, the men's NIT, the women's NIT, the women's CIT, and the men's CBI. And you have to do brackets for all of them. And whoever has the best cumulative wow. score through, through all of those uh, is declared the winner. So got to do your homework <laughs> like the day that's, before. That's pretty wild. I've never heard of anything like that. Wow. Yeah. But that answers my question. I was going to ask you how invested you are in the NIT and how much you've been paying attention, but you must be watching all of these games <laughs> and circling your brackets day and night, covering <laughs> six different tournaments at the same time. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I, you know, major props to Jeff Rusak for, you know, shouldering this burden <laughs> to go through and to actually like score everybody. You know, we just wait for like a week and a half to pass to see who would be when he has the time to, to see. You got to go check his winning. work. That's the type That's of thing that the commissioner might that be able you. to, you know, slip in a couple extra points for himself or to a friend. That's true. You know? That's true. I trust him, he, but his, his, his brain, he's one of the most creative people, uh, that I know. And as soon as he's like, Hey, let's do the mega bracket. I'm like, what the hell is the mega bracket? And we've been doing it for like four or five years. Well, let's ask college basketball beat writer, Tim Graham, <laughs> how excited he is for <laughs> the NIT quarterfinals tonight. Bono playing at Virginia on ESPN. One more win and they go to MSG. Just how much does this rate on your sexiness skill? I think it's, well, as far as uh, Western New York basketball, I think it's getting up to the sexiness of hosting the first couple rounds uh, because wow. St. Bonaventure, you know, the NIT is still, with the exception of those, you know, play-in games, the NIT is still, you know, pretty much the same uh, tournament it's always been in, term, in, in regard to um, its prestige. And it is not the 65th or now the 60, whatever, however many of whatever best they used to be they're the 65th best best team in basketball is the NIT champion that's not true uh there's still a lot of prestige involved i know that the the uh, the alums at St Bonaventure uh would be thrilled to see it happen and in the way that they're doing it to have to go all the way out to Colorado uh i think the farthest the team had to travel in the first round they didn't come anywhere close yes. to playing even in their own time zone they 5, go out 000, to Colorado 5559 miles and they win at elevation after not being able to practice out there. That's no small feat. Uh, then to be able to uh, win in their second round game, also a big travel. You know, they're, they're not able to play at home. Now they have to go play at Virginia. And I know that there are a lot of Bonaventure fans uh, and alums who are upset about the so-called seeding aspect because based on all the upsets that there have been so far, Bonaventure should have hosted a game by now. They're not. They're going to play at Virginia tonight. Um, so, but that's the chip on the shoulder type thing that makes this sexy. I think that if they if they didn't have that, if they don't have that finger to wag at people and uh, the ability to you know uh, consider themselves overlooked and, and play the whole Bonaventure uh, ID up to the hilt like they have been and Mark Schmidt has been, and I've, I've seen the post game uh, news conferences that have been posted on, on social media. I think that's what makes it really cool. And I think normally I wouldn't really be that into it, but um, Bonaventure having to overcome uh, seems pretty cool to me. And it yeah. is a team that over the last couple of years has always played better as an underdog. They're the only team left in the, of the eight remaining that had to win two road games. It didn't get any home games and probably the only one of the eight, that didn't play in the at home in the first round. I think there's a legit complaint maybe from Bonnet fans about the seeding and the season they had and where they slotted in the A-10 and three other A-10 teams getting top four seeds and Bonnet being the one that didn't, so they didn't get that initial home game. But I will say, if you know the NIT, that is how – there's no gripe that they should have been home tonight because they were the five seed. That's how the NIT does it. They only seed one through four, everybody else – is unseated and could play on the road or could play at home. But they decided based on how they want to do it with ticket sales. And it used to be the whole NIT. Kenesha's hosted two home games in 1995, I think was the year. 
and they weren't seated. They just thought they could sell tickets in the odd and they did. So that's just how the NIT has always worked. It's always been this kind of backroom national invitation tournament where they make the match up. I don't really have a problem with that. It's part of the charm, but I, but I can also under, understand that the proud uh, fans down uh, in the Southern tier and the way that the Riley center is such an electric place when there are games that have stakes. Uh, it is such a fun atmosphere. They just can't sell as many tickets. I think that the right. NIT would rather just go for tickets sold rather than environment. Yeah, they're, 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 um, I'm looking forward to watching that game uh, this evening. And if they can sneak through, I mean, getting to MSG is no small feat there. you know, the other side of the brackets, probably, I think, I think they would have to deal with Xavier probably if um, I think Xavier and Vanderbilt are the two teams. Yeah. Yeah. One of them. It seems Vanderbilt barely snuck out the win over Dayton. I saw um, it. Seems like Xavier's always good <laughs> in the postseason tournament. Xavier's a team that was in the A10 not that long ago and a right. bit of a traditional rival for Bonaventure in a way. I've always said year to year, when whether it's Bonner or UB, and people are talking about whether they get into the NCAA tournament or not, but they seem like a definite NIT quality team if they didn't make the tournament, that this would be uh, more fun to follow and maybe a more memorable season to see a team make a run in the NIT to MSG mm -hmm. than as opposed to losing one game in the NCAA tournament. Maybe if you win or your St. Peter's or what Buffalo did a couple of years ago, that's better. But Bana hasn't won an NCAA tournament game in their last, they won a playing game, but they haven't won a first round game in their last three, four, five times they've made the tournament over the years and, and making this run to MSG if they do win this game tonight could be a pretty memorable and, and special end to this era with these seniors. It's the 35th anniversary of when they won the NIT in 1977. When they were in the NIT a couple of years ago, they lost that first game at home. So they haven't had this kind of NIT run, NIT season in a very long time at St. Bonaventure. Very cool stuff. We'll have to save NBA talk for the next time uh, Joe Biscalia comes on and, and also Jamison Crowder. Mm. Um, I had a dream last night that Cole Beasley was living in my basement. Wow. Interesting. And um, unfortunately, I, 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 I was a bad landlord because he was out of town for a couple of days. And I waited until the day he was coming back to have the room painted. And so that wasn't nice of me to do because of the fumes and everything. And it's a basement room. So there wasn't, you know, like great. You can't just open windows. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came back from his trip. I asked him how he was doing. He didn't say anything, you know, to me, you know, un unusual. I apologized for the paint job and that it was so late. I had to go to work. I went to work and was informed that uh, he had been suspended, that the bills had suspended him. And I'm like, holy smokes, what a bad weekend. And he didn't tell me about it, but I understand because I'm in the media. You know, he didn't want me just to know that. But here the guy's suspended. He's got nowhere to go. And uh, he's he's got he's huffing huffing paint fumes. Wow. I'm that is an elaborate dream. <laughs> I suggest I would like, actually, I, I'm, I'm fishing now for anybody who's made it to the end of this podcast to give me uh, their interpretation of my Cole Beasley dream. Uh, oh, also, by the way, this is, Matt Hawk was not living with me, but he also was suspended. The bill suspended <laughs> Cole Beasley and Matt Hawk. And uh, but I was more concerned with my tenant, you know. Right. You just you just wanted a punt to Palooza. In your subconscious, that's that's what you maybe, wanted. maybe I think it has something to do with huff and paint. <laughs> I'm fascinated to let's see, see some. Yeah, give me some interpretations. But yeah, um, all right. Um, I got to go get my hair cut. Uh, that was not. That's not part of the dream. That's actual. Uh, I need to get to uh, my appointment uh, so I can stop wearing hats. And uh, Joe, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Um, Again, and hopefully my explanation to uh, the listeners out there uh, can tell people, Joe and I have no beef. There's no beef between Joe and I. I love There's probably more beef between Joe and I, and he's on all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why you guys get along so well, because you don't podcast together. It might be. Eh, fair. fair. Um, Joe, thank you for this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Any Anytime when, you know, when we have that, that nice little break where we're not... Uh, you know, I guess stepping on each other's pod toes, pods, stepping on each other's pods. I don't know. Pulling each other's pods. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you need classic Rodak line. <laughs> All 
All right, guys. Thanks for this. Thanks for everybody to listen. Thanks to everybody for listening to Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. Hey, uh, before we wrap up, let me remind everybody that you should uh, go check out Amherst Pizza and Ale House for all the college and pro games, especially now with that legalized sports betting in New York. You know you want to go to a place that's got a bunch of TVs so you can monitor all the different action. And Amherst Pizza and Ale House allows you to do that. Not only football, hockey, whatever you need, but the pay-per-views, the boxing and the uh, mixed martial arts events, they have those. 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville. That's right off Millersport Highway in the 990. Uh, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Uh, stop in or call for takeout and delivery. Obviously, uh, fantastic wings, fingers, the pizza, of course. It's right there in the title. 716-625-7100. Again, Amherst Pizza Nail House number 716 716- 625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and is partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Oh,